It's been the case throughout the history of the internet. We've constantly been surprised. Whoa. When we look at the internet and where it came from and where it's arrived today and where it's headed, I think it's quite clear that the engineers didn't really realize just how much this was going to change things. People thought we were crazy, right? Yeah. The internet thing is never going to be as important as the telephone or the television. In this series, we'll journey through the past, present, and future of that revolution we call the internet. We'll go inside the hidden places, practices, and people who make it hum and ask, why do we all love it so much? This is the internet, really right here. We usually think of it as invisible, up somewhere in the cloud. But this is where the invisible becomes visible, where the intangible becomes concrete. I'm Derek Muller, and I'm in an internet exchange point, one of hundreds of places around the world where computers, networks all link up to form the global internet. What's happening in here is that countless routers and switches are receiving data from one network and they're passing it over to another network via real physical cables. So it's a network of networks, all interconnected, which is why we call it the internet. And here you can actually reach out and physically touch it. Everything we've ever recorded, or for that matter, ever written, texted, or tumblered, passes through these global internet exchange points. It is a cosmic journey, the likes of which neither Newton, Tesla, nor Einstein could ever have fathomed. All of it traveling at the speed of light. I spend most of my working life here on the internet. Now, I know that may sound a little bit nerdy, but I actually really enjoy it. I create and host an online science channel called Veritasium, meaning the element of truth. It is my dream job because I'm passionate about science and now I can investigate topics I've always wondered about. Isn't that cool? And bring my world of science to a massive international audience. Whoa. I capitalize on the reach of the web. For example, after uploading this video called The Surprising Application of the Magnus Effect. Oh, look at that go! <laughs> It has now been viewed by more than 50 million people from around the world. Not bad for a film about a fluid dynamical effect. As a species, we have an inbuilt need to connect with others, to communicate and share our stories, to create community in essence. And the internet empowers us to do that in ways we never before imagined. In 1969, the same year that a man stepped on the moon, Leonard Kleinrock headed up a team of computer scientists later hailed as the fathers of the internet. And it all started in a room like this one. But the interesting thing is that if none of us had been born, we'd still have an internet today. It was in the air. It was going to happen. The inspiration to create a brand new network came from a branch of the Defense Department called ARPA the Advanced Research Projects Agency. Well, you know, ARPA was formed as a response to the 1957 Sputnik launch by the Russians. The Soviets had caught us with our pants down. We were behind in technology. At the time, computers were very large, very expensive, and separated by great distances. So a single user wishing to use multiple programs would have to travel to different locations. Computers need to talk to each other, and there was no way in which they were able to do so efficiently at the time. Here was the problem. If you were trying to send files or messages over a network, you'd have to put them in one at a time. So each message had to wait its turn. And if one of the messages were really big, it would take a long time to go through. The solution Leonard Kleinrock and his fellow internet pioneers came up with still lies at the heart of the internet today. It's called packet switching. 
in which all the messages are cut up into pieces of the same size, called packets. Then the packets can travel separately through the network, making the best use of every available space. So packets from small messages, well, they can squeeze into the gaps between packets from large messages, avoiding the long wait. And once those packets have reached their destination, they can be reassembled into their original messages. To do all that chopping and reassembling, a special device would connect computers to the network. This is the very first piece of internet equipment ever. This is where the internet began. It's the interface message processor. It's made out of a military hardened machine for the Department of Defense. Inside, you notice, it is so ugly, it's beautiful. It's my friend, has a unique odor, and it's really old equipment, but this is where the entire internet began, right here. The year is 1969. Richard Nixon is inaugurated as our 37th president, and more than a million people gathered at Woodstock to celebrate sex, drugs, and rock and roll. And on October 29th, Kleinrock's team at UCLA logged into a computer at the Stanford Research Institute. Now, to make sure this worked, because this was the first time these two host computers were going to talk to each other, to let somebody log in remotely, we had a telephone connection, just to be sure. Now, to log in, you have to type L-O-G. So, Charlie types the L and he says to Bill, you get the L? Bill says, got the L. Type the O, you get the O? Got the O. Type the G, crash. The system went down. The first message ever on the internet was low, as in, lo and behold. Samuel Morse had a good message on the telegraph network. He said, what hath God wrought? He prepared a message. He had the press and the media there. Alexander Graham Bell, Watson, telephone. Come here. come here, Watson, I need you. Neil Armstrong, giant leap for mankind. But it turns out that the message we sent was about as short, as prophetic, as powerful as you can imagine. Low, by accident. Our vision in those early days was machine to machine or person to machine. What I missed totally was that this was not about computers talking to each other. It was about people communicating with each other. By the end of 1969, there were just a few computers connected to the ARPANET. But the network grew steadily during the 1970s. But as they multiplied, it became more difficult for them to integrate into a worldwide system, and the desire for access to each other's data was enormous. Back in the 1970s, there was no single global internet as we know it today. Instead, there were lots of different networks, like the government's big ARPANET, and satellite networks, and little community operations. But they all had their own different format, and they connected to each other in different ways. So in short, if you weren't already on a network, there was no way to get to it. It was like the biblical tower of Babel. We needed a common language, a standard set of protocols that would allow all these networks to talk to each other. The internet got the common language it needed thanks to two pioneering scientists and this nondescript delivery van. Vint Cerf and Bob Kahn worked for years to solve the problem of connectivity. Bob showed up in my office at Stanford in 73 and says, we have a problem. You know, my reaction is, what do you mean, we? And he says, well, I'm trying to get these nets to interconnect, and I don't know how we should do that. Vint Cerf and Bob Kahn outfitted this vehicle with high-end computer hardware and radio transmission gear, and then they drove it through the streets of the Bay Area. On November 22nd, 1977, the team at this console was able to transmit a message to Los Angeles, 400 miles to the south. But they used three networks to do it. The two men developed a way for all the computer networks to communicate. It's been described as the handshake that introduces computers to each other. They also came up with a new word for what they were doing. Bob Cohn and I wrote this first paper describing a protocol for packet network intercommunication. And so internetworking 
was uh, the term that was used, but it was so clumsy. Bob Kahn called the project internetting, and eventually we started to refer to the object that we were building as the internet. Computers were still large, roughly the size of industrial refrigeration units. The only people who could afford them were large corporations, universities, and the military. But as they were manufactured to be smaller and smaller, personal computers began to take off, and so did the internet for the user at home. Probably 1981, uh, I bought a PC and tried to get hooked up to a modem, and it was really complicated, really difficult. But there still was something magical about the idea that I was you know, sitting at a computer connecting with people uh, and ideas all over the world. The standard speed of connection was 56 kilobits per second. So uploading a video or even a photo took a ridiculously long time. People were complaining. It was too slow. And we're going to fix that with the cable modem. Jim Phillips was an executive at Motorola in the mid-1990s when they developed a way to speed things up. Now we looked at all these cable companies, and they had this... Uh, way of communicating via hybrid fiber coax. Back in, the, in those days, they called it TV wire. What that gave us was really high-speed data, which we hadn't experienced before. And the best part, no more phone lines. Suddenly, you could download audio. You could download video, even. Beep, beep. Once you were connected, you could also join discussion groups and send email. One dial-up service rose to the top. AOL, America Online. Welcome. You've got mail. It took millions of Americans online for the first time. The mission of the AOL in the early days was to create a service that was easy to use, useful, fun, and affordable. Uh, but the broader mission and sort of the real mandate that was driving us, we really believed the Internet could be as important in people's lives as the, the telephone or the television, but even provide more value. To attract new customers, AOL used a brilliant marketing strategy. Honey! The new AOL disc is here. Remember those CDs? AOL just gave them away so people could load up the software and connect to the network. Millions signed up. At one point in the 1990s, half of all the CDs produced on Earth were from AOL. And users discovered new ways to find each other. For us, the community was everything. It was how, how do we create a whole suite of tools? Uh, so it started with email. It also was message boards and forums, things like that. But we also thought the real-time communication was important. So initially, we launched people connections, sort of chat rooms. Then we created instant messaging. AOL provided a gathering place for groups of people with shared interests. They could see all the traffic of so many communities coming online, so whether it was iVillage with women, or Blackberry Creek with young children, or Net Noir, the African American community, LGBT community we planted out. I used to call it the two-thirds rule. More than two-thirds of their traffic was people just talking to each other in their platforms, in a chat room, message board, etc. I used to even joke, I'm kind of like not just the CEO of the company, I'm kind of the mayor of the community. We asked a question in 2004 of a, of a lot of experts. What is the most surprising thing about the growth of the internet? And they said the spread of the web itself was what stunned them, just that so many people had so much to say. And of course, there's a lot of cat videos in that and a lot of cat pictures. Kittens, inspired by kittens. No. No. But there's also sort of profound sharing. My shirt matches the boxes behind me. I'm going to change. Yeah, I think that's better, although I wonder if we can take it down a button. No. Hi. One of the most famous to upload his life is John Green. John's best-selling novel, The Fault in Our Stars, became a hit movie. But millions feel like they know him personally because for years he's run a YouTube channel. You're very, very tall. <laughs> yeah, I know, and very white in this picture. Including this one, which is enormously popular with his brother Hank. My eye. From January 1st to December 31st, 2007, John Green and his brother Hank ran a video blog project they called Brotherhood 2.0. Every day for the entire year, the brothers sent each other videos. Don't you know the whole world's already gone and reserved a copy at Amazon? How many more books could you sell? I got to hang out with John, and we reached out to Hank. Yeah. Hmm. 
And good, good morning, morning Hank. Hank. It's Thursday. Thursday. Oh, <laughs>